you for spending part of your $30 ticket on uh, sitting through this uh, for 45 minutes. Um, my name is Donald Simpson. I'm a veteran of the comic book industry of 30 years. I used to draw and write comics. I'm still doing that. And uh, I'm also a, a teacher of art history. And I thought I'd put together a little bit of a uh, program for you talking about uh, corporate crossovers and independent worlds. It's called Epictopia to Call One's Own. And it's about uh, how independent creators create their own comic strips and comic books and worlds, uh, and how some of these get eventually absorbed into bigger company universes, and uh, in some cases, creators cross over with one another. And uh, I'm actually involved in a team up called War of the Independence, which we'll talk about at the end, which is a, a grandiose crossover of uh, Cerebus and Zippy the Pinhead lot of humor characters, including my own, but also a lot of other independent superhero characters and so on. So the idea is pretty simple. I have here Dog Patch by Al Cap. Al Cap is the creator of uh, Little Abner, mid-20th century comic strip in the DC universe there, Superman and Supergirl and Wonder Woman. Um, these are kind of the extremes. So you have a, a single creator and a cartoon comic strip with a lead character and a world around that character versus an entire shared universe of uh, a bunch of uh, decades of uh, different creators and different characters. So the first part, uh, simply enough, uh, again, Al Cap uh, had uh, Little Abner running in the comic strips for several decades. Uh, we have Sadie Hawkins Day and uh, other uh, cultural contributions from uh, that legacy. There was a musical and a movie and so on. Uh, but it's a, a main character, Little Abner, a hillbilly, and uh, Daisy May and the family, and he created a whole world, uh, a kind of an imaginary universe of his own to surround the character called Dog Patch, this kind of fabled hillbilly world. Uh, but this, is, this represents all the different kinds of comic strips and comic books uh, where a single creator creates a character. And... Um, Um, so that represents, you know, th comic strips like Bone and Cerebus and, and other creator-owned properties uh, since then. Um, to contrast that with the company universe, uh, publisher's universe, um, it's important to remember that the DC universe, what we call the DC universe now, started out as independent comic strips or comic book creations of uh, independent creators who created uh, autonomous characters surrounded by their own imaginary worlds, uh, Jerry uh, Siegel and Joe Schuster, a couple of uh, Jewish kids from Cleveland created Superman uh, in, 19, in the 1930s and eventually sold it to DC. Bob Kane uh, and uh, creators like uh, Bill Finger uh, and others uh, creating Batman, uh, also published by National Comics and um, <clears throat> Dr. William Moulton Marston creating uh, Wonder Woman. Uh, each of these characters have their own worlds. They're all they're designed to be separate. They're not they're not designed to be teamed up or uh, to be interrelated necessarily. Uh, Superman is in Metropolis, Batman's in Gotham City, uh, Wonder Woman is in Gateway City, and so on. They each have distinctive styles, uh, distinctive worldviews. I would argue, uh, but we've, we're so used to now seeing them together, teamed up. This is one of the earliest team-ups, World Finest Comics. What's interesting about this is that immediately Gotham City and Metropolis disappear. We have just this neutral yellow background where uh, the two figures, the two main characters, uh, and of course Robin the sidekick meet um, a yellow background. It's a yellow world. Um, and they're doing neutral things. They're doing a rickshaw. They're doing a tug of war. In fact, these early team-ups uh, are really only on the covers. They don't actually meet uh, in a story until, um, um, I think, Superman 72 in, in the 1950s, uh, and later uh, in World Finest uh, around 1955. So they don't actually uh, interact in a narrative. They just are, are together on the cover to promote the book. They're in separate stories uh, inside. 
Uh, here again, you have the World's Fair. You have kind of a generic skyline. It's neither Metropolis nor Gotham City. Um, Anyway, um, so again, we're, we're so used to seeing them teamed up uh, and sharing a universe, and now we have, an, you know, Gotham City and Metropolis both being basically New York City, but now, you know, decades later, we have to extrapolate, we have to map uh, uh, Metropolis as New York and uh, Gotham City as Chicago or something. We have to have uh, a universe now. Um, and of course, the, the styles blend the artists uh, take the costume designs and turn them into kind of a generic house style. Uh, you lose the distinctive uh, look and style of the original cartoonist creators, uh, but you also lose that sense of an, an autonomous world. It's no longer um, a distinctive worldview of a, a particular city or a particular place or milieu. Uh, the same thing happens with Wonder Woman and Flash and Green Lantern and Hawkman, and all, these are all, again, independent creations that have been grouped together, and we're just so used to seeing them uh, harmonized, so to speak, and their kind of their differences in drawing styles and their differences in worldviews kind of um, moderated that uh, they become, uh, we become used to seeing them this way. Again, you have this kind of interesting class portrait here's on a, a billboard or you have you know people running again neutral backgrounds this is no longer there's no longer a, a specific world surrounding these characters they just become um, uh, teamed up in a shared universe same thing is true with the marvel universe or the timely comics universe captain america by siegel or i'm sorry joe simon and jack kirby the human torch by carlos burgos and uh, bill everett submariner these are again conceived as distinct comic strip characters with distinct worlds, but they are so uh, so commonly uh, appearing together, and particularly by third-party artists like Alex Schomburg, uh, great, a great uh, illustrator in his own right, but we're so used to seeing these characters teamed up, uh, the great battle between the Human Torch and Submariner, water versus fire, and the kind of the, the proto-invaders in World War II, um, that we, we've lost the sense that these were once independent uh, creations. And again, uh, Schomburg uh, from 1943. And a great theme, this is one of the great comic books uh, of my youth, uh, Marie Severin's uh, Hulk, Submariner Battle. So in essential, essentially we've got Bill Everett's Submariner, we've got Jack Kirby's Hulk uh, drawn by a third party sharing the universe. We've, we've come to accept this very commonly, we're just so used to it lost uh, this sense that these were once distinct characters. Steranko now, uh, and Steranko is quite the historian of comics. He could have emulated the different styles of the original creators, but he's no longer uh, interested in doing that. Artists by this time are, are, are simply demonstrating their own style. So again, you have Steve Ditko, Spider-Man, uh, Hulk, uh, Thor, Silver Surfer, um, Thing, uh, Iron Man, Captain America, all the Kirby characters, uh, the Human Torch, Carlos Burgos, but again, everything has now been uh, brought together with Storanko's overwhelming style and his uh, classic signature. John Buscema, another example. And here you have even more uh, of a uh, uh, wide-ranging universe. You've got Dracula in the center and Frankenstein and Doc Savage was in the uh, Marvel Universe at this time. Um, Conan the Barbarian, so you've got all these different uh, really incompatible creations. These were once distinct uh, characters in distinct worlds. Uh, and we can still separate them out, and, and the movies, especially the Marvel movies, uh, have taken individual characters and separated them out. But again, we're just so used to seeing them uh, in these kind of jam universe poses uh, that we, we've come to accept them as uh, somehow compatible, but they really are not compatible. Um, Milton Kniff, uh, another example of a creator and his uh, autonomous world, he did two comic strips, Terry and the Pirates and Steve Cannon in the 20th century. Um, and 
you know, here, here's the creator surrounded by his various creations. This is the, the Steve Canyon cast. Uh, again, you know, cartoonists are creating autonomous worlds. They're not, um, not necessarily uh, at the dictates of publishers teaming up their characters with other creations. Um, but it's just interesting to point out this uh, John Romita, who's a staff, basically a staff artist at Marvel in the 60s, has surrounded himself with very similar Im imagery to Milton Kniff. Here's the artist at the drawing board daydreaming, dreaming up characters. Uh, but these are not his creations. This is Steve Ditko's Spider-Man, essentially, and all the villains. A uh, few, uh, few things that uh, uh, certainly John Romita is a great artist, one of my favorites growing up, um, but uh, is dreaming up characters basically with, with other people's creations. Uh, Joe Kubert uh, also kind of using the imagery that, uh, that Kniff uh, and other cartoonists have used, uh, the, uh, his galaxy of characters within the DC uh, pantheon, so to speak. Now, there's a couple different kinds of crossover universes that I'd like to point out. Uh, and one is just simply the promotional universe. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have actual narrative crossing over. Uh, and I'll show you what I mean. Uh, here's Joe Simon and Jack Kirby's letterhead from uh, 1947, and for some reason Captain America is miscolored, and some of you know the Red Skull is yellow for some reason. But this was their company letterhead, which went out you know to correspondence. These were all different creations and features that they created for different publishing companies. So uh, Captain America uh, and I think the Guardian, who's a DC uh, uh, stock creation and uh, the, you know, the kid gangs. Some of these are from different publishers, so they would never actually meet in a narrative. They only meet on the, corporate, on the uh, studio letterhead to kind of promote the studio and its uh, function of providing features for different publishers. So this is a, a kind of just a, simply a promotional universe. No, no stories are really even possible here. It's kind of unfortunate because these would have been some great, uh, I'm sure, great adventures. Um, this is not unprecedented. Uh, King Features Syndicate uh, did a lot of this kind of promotional uh, material. And uh, particular artist Louis Biederman, who was a staff artist at the Syndicate, would draw all the different characters, bringing up Father and Maggie and Jiggs and uh, uh, Felix the Cat, all these different uh, um, comic strip features. Uh, and they would, be, they would appear in calendars again, in very neutral kinds of things, like here they're at the racetrack or the ballpark, whatever they are in the grandstand. Uh, here's a, a publication called Circulation, which would have gone to the printing industry. And again, you're seeing all of the features uh, of King Features Syndicate uh, teamed up in this promotional image, but narratives, narr actual narrative crossovers are not possible because all of these features would have been syndicated to different newspapers, sometimes rival newspapers in the same city. So you could never have an actual crossover between comic strips uh, or uh, actual team-ups with uh, uh, Felix the Cat and uh, Crazy Cat <laughs> or whatever. Um, kind of unfortunate. Now, one way to get across some of these divides of companies and legal ownership and syndication is the parody universe and maybe the classic example is uh, uh, Harvey Kurtzman and Wally Wood's Super Duper Man, which gave us this parody team up or crossover between Captain Marvel and Superman. Now this wouldn't have been possible actually in the 1950s. Fawcett uh, Comics, the publisher of uh, Captain Marvel and, and Superman were bitter rivals. In fact, they ended up, uh, DC ended up suing Fawcett for infringement succeeding uh, in their legal action. But if only for fan desire, this they could, uh, you know, we could be satisfied to see at least a humorous uh, encounter depicted. Uh, in the 1960s, of course, Marvel and DC are the two uh, rival publishing companies. Uh, but they seem to be flirting with this idea of Superman meeting the Fantastic Four, the kind of the flagship titles of each company. So Not Brandeck is doing a parody. Uh, of course, Marvel is parodying their own characters, the Fantastic Four, but they're also including Superman. 
the Inferior Five is a DC comic, and Superman is their own character, but of course there's the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man. So it seems like both companies are kind of wanting to cross over, but they can only do it through these kind of par parodic gestures. Then along comes this punk named Don Simpson, that would be me, uh, and my parody creation from the 1980s, I, I'm doing the same thing. I've got basically Superman meeting the Fantastic Four uh, in the, uh, these early issues from uh, 1985. Um, anyway, we'll get back to that. Um, another interesting aspect of the parody universe uh, is the introduction of Howard the Duck. And you have to explain to audiences today uh, how incredibly important it was for a generation of cartoonists. This was right when I was starting to draw, uh, you know, I was in middle school or junior high school, uh, drawing comics. If you loved superheroes and you were drawing Spider-Man and Captain America, you also had to learn how to draw a duck because this was, became such a phenomenal, um, popular um, uh, feature uh, in, in the uh, mid-1970s. And this particular sequence of panels, this is from Giant Size Man Thing number five, <clears throat> this says it all. This is incredibly important. There are worlds upon worlds, worlds within worlds, worlds without end. Every man's mind, a universe. Uh, so this, those were just earth-shattering uh, concepts when I was 14 or so. So I think it, it uh, influenced a generation. We'll get back to that. So there's another kind of uh, universe, a crossover team-up universe, the so-called, I'm calling it the special occasion or neutral ground universe. Um, I'm thinking of historical publications like Steranko's History of Comics, where he talks about the pulps and he talks about the golden age of comics and different eras. But he does this beautiful wraparound cover around this oversized large format publication. So you see, for the first time, uh, you know, Batman, Superman, Silver Surfer, uh, Captain America, Submariner, um, Sheena, Queen of the Jungle, the Joker, Spider-Man, um, on and on, Captain Marvel, Hawkman. These are characters that could not be teamed up except in some kind of uh, special event or this, in this case a, a history of comics, kind of a neutral um, fair use universe. And the second, uh, the second uh, volume of his history has got Black Hawk and other characters against Sheena, Plastic Man, and so on. So, again, we're not, we're not talking about actual narratives or actual stories, but just this kind of um, wish or dream of uh, teaming up these characters. Same thing's going on in the underground comics of the time. This is the Rand Holmes cover to the History of Underground Comics. And you have Wonder Warhog uh, and uh, the fabulous furry brothers and Robert Crumb and uh, Robert Williams characters, Mickey, Mickey the Rat, uh, on and on. Um, and um, this was a much more far-ranging, far sa uh, snappy, snappy Sammy Smoot over there. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, it was a much more far-ranging far team-up than might have been possible uh, to get all these guys together. Of course, Zap Comics uh, did have uh, jams uh, in their comics, so you have uh, Victor Moscoso and his dinosaur television set guys and taxi cabs, and you have Robert Crumb and uh, let's see who else? Uh, S. Clay Wilson, uh, Spain Rodriguez, Rick Griffin, Robert Williams, Gilbert Shelton. And so these artists are actually jamming. This is almost a, another category of team ups, the jam universe, where, where car uh, cartoonists are drawing their own characters and uh, creating this, uh, this team-up, a very abstract and, and bizarre surrealist team-up in this case. Um, but this requires, of course, uh, trafficking around the artwork and getting everybody to physically be able to draw on it, which is a little bit difficult. I've been involved in some of those kind of jam team-ups. Another, another case of a special event team-up would be the cover of the Comics Journal, which could do Cerebus and the Spirit and Delgota and Omaha the Cat Dancer, and Howard Chaikin's uh, American Flag, uh, Zot, Neil the Horse, Robert Crumb could all team up 
again, not really in a narrative and not a story, uh, but uh, for a kind of polemical cartoon about this was a, the comic book industry at the time, which, which publisher was going to go out of business first. They were all racing over the cliff. And Scott McCloud doing his globe here in understanding comics. He can, again, team up all these characters kind of as a neutral educational exercise. His famous pyramid, which also appears in Understanding Comics, um, and somebody's got to explain McCloudianism to me. This is beyond me. But for some reason, uh, there's my character right in the middle. I, I, I'd like to know what the cosmic significance is of being exactly in the middle of the triangle. So this has something to do with re meaning, reality, the picture plane, huh? certain abstract symbolisms. Anyway, so those kinds of team-ups uh, are possible. Again, the Comics Journal, this is my cover to the Comics Journal from 1987, and I was able to indulge my desire to see, you know, the spirit and Inky Bilal and Steve Root's uh, Nexus and Bill Loeb's and Omaha the Camp Dancer and Harvey Pico, Reed Fleming, Ralph Snart, Swamp Thing. Uh, again, uh, team-ups that could never actually happen in a narrative, at least not so easily as putting them into a, a group shot like this. So an, yet another category, and uh, we're talking now of the 1980s, the 1970s, 1980s, uh, the cross-company crossover and company-wide crossover events. So at this point in uh, comics history, uh, publishers are beginning to um, awakened to the fact that fans will actually pay to see these team ups, especially Superman versus Spider-Man. Spider-Man and Dracula did not, that was kind of just a, an internal Marvel team up. Um, noteworthy because they don't actually meet, they kind of, you know, the vampire universe and the superhero universe don't quite blend together. But Superman and Spider-Man certainly, what's interesting is uh, there's no dimensional explanation in this narrative. It's just like, Superman or Clark Kent, Lois Lane, they just come to New York. Like, they've never been to New York. They've always been in Metropolis. But I thought they were the same city. I mean, I don't know. So there's no narrative explanation. Nobody gets caught in a black hole. They just kind of run into each other one day. Um, and of course, the, the granddaddies of crossovers, the Secret Wars and Crisis on Infinite Earths, so that's every character all the time. What's interesting about these team-ups is that uh, Nobody ever has time to be in their secret identity anymore. They're just wearing their costumes all the time, and everybody else has got their costume on. So more in, in my era of uh, creators of the 80s and the 90s, we begin to see satirical or synthetic universes. Creators begin to internalize this idea of crossovers and universes and shared universes, and they begin to, instead of creating a single character in a world, they begin doing a whole universe at once. Um, and again, this is a, a job that I was involved in. I illustrated uh, in Pictopia, hence the title of the talk. And this was Alan Moore's mixture of syndicate cartooning, comic book company characters, and animation and all, all that kind of stuff. And they all live in a little city where, um, uh, things are threatened by corporate takeovers, so even the buildings have panels of comic strips here. Uh, and Mandrake, the ma magician, uh, lives in a slum, and uh, Blondie is turned to prostitution. It's a very, it's a very polemical uh, use of the universe idea that uh, the sinister uh, corporations are taking over. This was my friend Mike, excuse me, Mike Kazala, who did the animated um, slum on the animal area, part of the city. And Plastic Man has become an alcoholic because funny comics aren't, aren't popular anymore. And then there's these new bullies on the block, the kind of mutant X-Men kind of people. Um, Mandrake, or whatever he's called, the magician character, is uh, uh, kind of the central protagonist. And he's hanging out in the bar with the yellow kid and all this other stuff. Now this is before uh, who framed Roger Rabbit. So this was kind of an original uh, idea. But Alan Moore in this case had a, a, a point to make about the industry at that time, whereas Disney and, uh, was just kind of teaming up 
Warner Brothers and Flesher cartoons and so on. Of course, the image universe itself is a synthetic universe. This is a bunch of creators who got together and created their characters not as independent entities, but with the understanding that it would be a shared universe. This was Image United, which is still unfinished. I thought that this was a really shared universe, but they've never actually had much more than a few team-ups. Uh, Kurt Busiek, I think, has done more uh, in that vein of uh, thinking through an entire universe and creating an entire universe all at once, not just a single character in the world, but a whole kind of uh, big company universe uh, with lots of complicated characters. And uh, something else I was involved in, 1963, which was published by Image Comics, Alan Moore again, Rick Veach, and Steve Bissett, and they were creating a pseudo Marvel comics group era kind of universe. Uh, again, these are independent uh, titles or you know, separate titles, Mr. Incorporated, The Fury, Uncanny, and so on, uh, but they are designed to be a universe of interaction and, of course, the, the grandiose team-up that was supposed to end the series was never finished, so it's this unfinished political universe. Uh, this is a panel from, I think this is a, this is the Mystery Incorporated panel. And this is uh, from 1963. Here's my universe of bizarre heroes. There's Cerebus the Aardvark, uh, Rick Beach, um, Mr. Monster. Uh, here's Jim Valentino's Normal Man and so forth. So they're making a nod to all of us independent creators and, and we're all in independent we're all in different dimensions. Everything's got to be a dimension now. We're all separated by dimensions. Uh, Big Bang versus 1963. So now you have universes teaming up with one another. It's not just a single character teaming up, but the entire universe has to uh, interact with another universe. Um, but I'd like to point out that even a, a comic book like the Fantastic Four can be thought of as a synthetic universe. This was really a team up within a single title you had the uh, kind of H.G. Wells' Invisible Person, Carlos Burgos' Human Torch, um, kind of Plastic Man, even uh, Bill Everett's Submariner. So these are, you know, Kirby was kind of synthesizing uh, a universe from, from uh, different ideas. You can think of this as a kind of team up within uh, its own title. Um, to digress a little bit, in the 1970s there was an idea put forward by Philip Jose Farmer. It's come to be known as the Wool Newton universe. And his obsession, of course, Farmer is, is doing this, I think, with his tongue in cheek, but he's obsessed that all these pulp fiction characters, Tarzan, Sherlock Holmes, The Shadow, Doc Savage, are really related. So why did they, why did they all have different publishing contracts with different pulp publishers? I don't know. But he, he uh, extrapolates this incredibly complicated family tree, so G8 is related to Alan Quartermain and so on and so forth. I did a little parody of this in Megaton Man. I have Doc Megaton, and in fact I have a little uh, janitor who's named Philip Jose, and a family tree of Megaton Man, and uh, there's a frog and uh, a wolverine and so forth. Anyway, uh, so this was a, a, an, a, an influential idea uh, Alan Moore, again, uh, has used it more than anybody else in comics with the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. You've got uh, Captain Nemo, Alan Quatermain, uh, Jekyll and Hyde, Tom Sawyer uh, as a kind of Victorian supergroup teaming up. Again, independent creations. They weren't designed to go together. They, they were written by different authors in distinct worlds, but Alan is taking them all because they're in the public domain can do this. So now we get to the final uh, era of team-ups, the present era, and we have this interesting phenomenon, which again I'm involved in uh, tangential, tangentially, the voluntary team-up or the pseudo-corporate crossover. And you have characters, uh, you have the creators teaming up with one another, but the, the granddaddy of them all is this project called War of the Independence, which been published by Red Anvil Comics. Uh, three issues have come out. It's a six-issue series. And these are all independent 
characters, and the creators have given their permission to have a kind of Secret Wars Crisis on Infinite Earth team up. So you've got the Tick, you've got Zippy the Pinhead, Too Much Coffee Man, um, uh, hundreds of other, there's Milk and Cheese, hundreds of other characters that I can't even begin to name, uh, Badger, uh, She, and just in terms of getting everybody to sign a contract and turn it back in, uh, the individual creators are not drawing and inking their own characters, thank God you could imagine all the FedEx packages running around or the, all the scanning and emailing that ha would have to take place. But um, my involvement is in the, um, the long-awaited fourth issue, uh, which I just finished this week, as a matter of fact. This was the first page I did, and I, uh, <laughs> I was going back to college. I looked online and somebody was looking for me. Somebody named Dave Ryan was looking for me on a bulletin board contacted him months after he made this post and I said hi I'm Don Simpson I sent him an email he uh, he said I'm sorry who are you <laughs> he'd forgotten why he wanted to get in touch with me so I, I created Megaton Man I imagine you want to get my permission for this team up oh yeah yeah I'm sorry so anyway he uh, we decided I would just do a, a page cameo so I'm drawing my characters but I'm also drawing milk and cheese and bone and Drunken Monkey, Too Much Coffee Man, Zippy, Flaming Carrot, and uh, that was just going to be it. I was just going to do this one page, and there was, they are all running around uh, a restaurant, and uh, dishes go flying. But uh, a couple years later, uh, Dave got the permission for to use the tick, and he thought, well, why not have Megaton Man meet the tick on the back cover? So I did the back cover, and uh, again, I got to draw Zippy, and this is Yarn Man, one of my characters, Cerebus. I originally drew uh, Billy Tucci's She up here, but uh, that she's not in the issue, so he pasted it over with uh, Felix the Cat. Milk and Cheese, Bone, Flaming Carrot. Um, and then this, this book just kind of languished for a couple of years, and he said, why, not, why don't you draw the whole thing? So now I have to draw all these different characters. And this is very different from the comics journal cover I showed you before. The comics journal cover, I could just swipe individual drawings line for line and imitate the inking styles. But here I had to actually learn how to draw these characters so I could tell a story because they all move in different ways and you can't, you can never find the right pose to swipe. So I actually had to learn how to draw the Archie characters. Uh, unfortunately, Archie pulled out, so this panel was completely invalidated. But you have, uh, there's uh, Stan Sakai's uh, Yusagi Yojimbo, uh, Pokey and Gumby, uh, there was this, uh, well, Bean World's uh, Mr. Spook, Zippy, The Tick, and these are all uh, MLJ Archie characters, Archie, Betty, Veronica, Jughead. This is some, a character called Super Duck. I never even heard of this from the 50s. Um, there's an alien character, Oscar the Alien or something. Uh, but I, I had to do research and I had to learn how to draw these characters. Um, as I say, I just uh, just wrapped this up this week. This is the, the final page. There's Protoplasm Man, Too Much Coffee Man. Um, these are these are Public Enemy. The two <laughs> rappers, Public Enemy, are in the story. Uh, Rat Bastard is in the story. There's Megaton Man. I, I, Megaton, my own, my characters only appear on a couple different pages. They're uh, they're not the main. Characters. I didn't want to use this as a promotional vehicle, but I do have them kind of sticking in a couple panels here. Cerebus and, of course, Zippy, Tick, and Flaming Carrot. These are uh, some of Dave's uh, animation characters. So I finally wrapped this up this week. Um, so it's gotten to the point where, you know, publishers, fans wanted to see team ups, publishers wanted to uh, satisfy that market and, and cross over Batman and Superman. Characters, uh, but now independent character, independent creators themselves have internalized this ethos, and we're doing it ourselves. We're kind of arranging our own cosmic uh, crossovers, and that's my uh, that's my presentation to you. Um, thank you very much. So we have time for some questions. Was it much of a challenge to 
not only learn to draw those characters, but to inter interpret them like in your own style and put your own spin on it, rather than just copy the way they look. I understand you didn't want to, you couldn't just swipe, but there's also this emulating how they look in their original publications. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, let me just show you. This is this is a sketchbook. These are some slides that I cut from the from the uh, presentation. This, this, these are some. I went through Bowen in this case, and I just swiped figures just to get used to the character. I'm not a funny animal, or a, if Bowen is an animal or whatever he is, I'm not a, a, an animation traditional artist. So I had to swipe and, and just kind of get the feeling for it. Uh, let's see what else I can show you. I certainly had to, uh, I had to. I had to study Cerebus. I'd read these, you know, characters, but I hadn't really. Um, I hadn't really doodled. I hadn't grown up, grown up uh, drawing them in my uh, sketchbook or anything. So I had to. I had to study them and become familiar with them. This is the Archie characters, which didn't make the cut, as I said. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get uh, kind of the Dan DiCarlo style. Oscar, oh, is it the Cosmo, Cosmo the Merry Martian? That's that's uh, a rare uh, '50s comic, um, Josie and the Pussycats and stuff. So I had I had to do some homework and I had to kind of study these characters. But as I say, you you couldn't, you can't be faithful to the style always because um, maybe that Cerebus panel is a good panel. I needed. Um, I needed Cerebus to function in the narrative. I needed him to do a certain pose and a certain body language and make an expression on his face. And I couldn't find anything in Dave Sim that would perfectly match it. So I had to just kind of fake it and do it the best I could. So it's kind of, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not going to fool anybody. I don't think anybody's going to say, well, that's a Dave Sim drawing of Cerebus or it's a Jeff Smith drawing of Bone. But I just I have to just do my best and you have to. Uh, I found that that was the case with Zippy uh, and all the other characters that I drew. Um, sooner or later, just like John Romita or Louis Biederman or whoever, third party artist, Marie Severin, uh, you, can't, you can't emulate Ditko and Kirby and all the different creators of the original characters forever. You have to more or less find your own, uh, find your own style. So I was, you know, the first time I'd ever drawn Toxic Avenger and Milk and cheese, and, and the, the blockheads, and Gumby and Pokey, and so forth. Yosagi Yojimbo. Um, I just had to, you know, come come as close as I could. But what's interesting about this process, I think, if if I were to continue, or, or if any artist were to continue to draw these characters over and over again in a, a, a shared universe, if Disney bought all these characters and they, you know, kind of had a Secret Wars. Uh, sooner or later, they would all kind of eventually harmonize. They would still look recognizably like the Tick and Zippy and Flaming Carrot, but sooner or later, oh, there's, that's not too good. Um, that's okay. It's an old laptop. Um, sooner or later, they would they would homogenize into a, a house style, and you know they would look uh, they would look just like. Not exactly like one another, but you just only have like uh, costume designs to tell them, uh, and tell them apart. I just lost my computer, so it's got to reboot now. <laughs> it does spill water on me. Uh, another question. I'm drawing my character. Yeah, like if they ask you permission to like draw, draw a panel or something like that, draw a punch, or, um, or like a, a sample, and they want you to draw. Do they ask you like to um, draw to their liking, or do they ask you to draw in your own? Um, well, when I've done work for hire for big companies, um, you know, obviously you're you're trying to follow their model and trying to follow their look at the at the time so that's kind of the job of the freelancer I think 
Uh, and I've certainly done enough of that kind of work for hire work um, where you're, you're trying to go with the flow. Um, I've used my characters in team ups with different characters and you have to kind of find an equilibrium between, um, between uh, different characters' uh, styles. I'll try to reboot this, sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm answering your question. You do have to tailor uh, tailor your style to the assignment. That's a really good question. I think in War of the Independence, um, nobody's really seen anybody but Dave Sim draw Serapis or Bob Burton draw the Flaming Carrot, so, uh, or Bill Griffith draw Zippy. So these are, these are characters that people are used to seeing one artist draw them. So I, I tried my best to emulate their style. Um, I don't think I'm going to fool too many, you know, really savvy people. But I think, like I said, uh, for, for a shared universe like the Marvel or DC universe, people are so used to seeing those characters drawn by Starenko and John Buscema, John Romita, Rob Liefeld, all the way down the line, John Byrne. So they're used to the artist. In fact, there's, there would be more opportunity for those artists to show their own style. Starenko is going to show his own style drawing the Marvel, and Neil Adams is going to show his own style. They're, they're no longer, uh, it's no longer a game of trying to uh, look like Bob Kane or Kirby or you know, Ditko or anything like that. But I think with, with War of the Independence, I was trying to you know, not go too far away from, from Jeff Smith or um, Cerebus, uh, because th those characters uh, have only been seen by you know, really from one hand you know, all this time. So this is the first time, or maybe, you know, maybe, maybe there might be Occasional spot illustration by another artist, but, but most most of the zippy narrative has been drawn by Bill Griffith. So, so in that case, you're still I think you're going to be closer or want to be closer to the originator style. Oh no, that was a project started by Dave Ryan, um, and in fact, Paul Paul Castiglia wrote the script for that issue that I that I illustrated, issue number four. Uh, so that was a um, that that had gotten underway before I was involved. Uh, and as I said, I was just uh, originally I was just going to draw my two cents worth of my characters um, for uh, uh, just for that one page. Scene. Uh, and then I was asked to do the whole thing after a couple of years, but you know, just was sitting around. He, uh, they, I think Dave Ryan wanted to draw it, but he just didn't have time, so he said, finally, why don't you do it? So and that's how you do something like that in strictly your own style. Well, <laughs> War of the Independence, I, I would never undertake such a project. Well, I would never, I would, it would never occur to me. I mean, I've, you know, uh, <laughs> just the headache of getting all permission slips and so on. But um, yeah, if I were totally left to my own device, I mean, I, I guess m more of my own style would, would be asserted. Uh, I, I felt toward the end, particularly I was kind of relaxing and I'd drawn the character so many times. Uh, it, it, my involvement itself took a couple of years. So the first time I drew Zippy to the last time, I felt I felt a lot more comfortable toward the end. And Flaming Carrot, I, I could draw without looking at anything. So. Naturally, I just got um, I got more comfortable as I went. I think that's it. We're all done. About 45 minutes. Well, thank you so much for spending part of your day here, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the convention. And uh, stay cool, and we'll see you this weekend. I'm down in Artist Alley in A6. I'm doing sketches. And I do have uh, samples of, of all uh, many of these projects, so you can take a look at some of the original work. And so on. Thanks a lot. Thank you.